Uh, maybe. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, election last night, um, inconsequential. Republicans won the Senate and the Democrats won the House. Uh, why is that important? Uh, it's important because the uh, branch of the uh, government that controls the president is the House of Representatives. So the Senate can't really do anything with the president um, unless the House does something. So while the Republicans controlled the House, uh, there was no oversight over the president. But now that the president, now that the House is controlled by Democrats, then they can control what the president does. So if he does something wrong, I mean, like, is he defrauds on his tax, tax return or something. Uh, if he does that, then uh, it's the, up to the House of Representatives uh, to subpoena his tax returns. And, of course, that's one of the things that potentially is happening. In, in this state, uh, the senatorial race hasn't been called yet uh, because there's still some votes that are out. Um, there's still some votes that are out. So that race hasn't been called yet. Uh, as far as the uh, House of Representatives... Uh, there are nine representatives from this state. Five of them were, have, are Democrats. Well, actually, four of them are Democrats. Four are Republicans, and then there's one that's still too close to call. So that's what's happening in this state. Anyway, so we'll see what happens. We'll see, see how everything turns out. Uh, but the Democrats won the House, and the uh, Republicans picked up seats in the Senate. Uh, Do you guys have a governor? No, there wasn't. You, you guys weren't elected your governor. Okay. Uh, Democrats were real and a lot of trouble as far as governors were concerned. They picked up four seats, four governors, uh, governorships. So not a whole lot going on. Kind of a kind of a draw between the Democrats and the Republicans last night. Uh, okay. So we talked about uh, them trying to eliminate the uh, the uh, insanity plea. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in Eddings versus Oklahoma in 1982 held that a trial court must consider any potentially mitigating information, uh, such as evidence that argues against a death sentence, when considering a sentence of death. Some jurisdictions also consider the question of a defendant's future risk to society. Um, I was very proud of the reservation. There was a lot of voting that came out off the reservation. Uh, the more you guys vote, the less they can ignore you. So you've got to make sure that this happens every election, whether I'm here or not harassing you, uh, which couldn't. I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be here forever. Neither are you. You're going to graduate. You're going to be gone. Well, all you guys are going to be gone, so don't worry about it. Anyway, you need to vote, and you need to harass your relatives to vote. And if they try to give you that old, oh, I don't know, I don't care about politics, it's so dirty. Yeah, it's so dirty because nobody votes and forces people to do what they're supposed to do. So everybody needs to vote. Everybody needs to vote. No matter where you're from. You guys, and you guys voted. You did a good job. I appreciate it. Uh, I looked at Apache County. Apache County went uh, Democratic, interestingly enough. Uh, but if you look at Apache County, it was like 60, 65, 35, uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, you look at Navajo County, which I thought was kind of interesting. Navajo County was right about, it broke just about even. But Navajo County has a lot of white people in it. I mean, it's not all reservations. Right, the southern port portion of Navajo County is Holbrook and Snowflake and uh, Shola. So there's a lot of white people as well. Coconino County went Democrat. So natives tend to vote. Uh, oh, it was interesting. Did anybody watch uh, CNN last night? Watching the returns coming in. Anybody look at Montana on CNN? They had all of the, uh, the, the reservations highlighted. I know, it's kind of interesting. So there was Fort Belknap right in the middle of the state. And over here was Flathead. And over here was Fort Peck. That was kind of cool. So they were looking at the reservations. Because the reservations vote Democratic. They tend to vote Democratic. 
So they were, and of course those were like the only blue places in the in the state where the, all the reservations, Fort Pack, Fort Belknap, Flathead Reservation. Flathead is uh, Salish Kootenai. They're not really Flatheads. That's just an old name. They ought to change that name. Clinical evaluations must uh, also address the question of eligibility for uh, capital sentencing if the defendant may be intellectually disabled, which would exempt the defendant from the death penalty consistent with the Supreme Court decision of Atkins versus Virginia, where they tried to execute an individual that was had a, an intellectual deficit. He was uh, not real smart. Okay. Uh, juvenile transfer, uh, during the 1980s and 1990s, there was reform in the juvenile and criminal justice system in the United States to allow more frequent prosecution of juveniles in criminal adult courts. Once upon a time in the United States, if you were under the age of 18, you were never tried as an adult anywhere in the United States. So if you were 18 or 17 years old and you murdered somebody, when you turn 21, they'd have to release you from, from prison. Every state had a juvenile uh, jail, a juvenile uh, prison. Every state did. Uh, but then in the 18, 1980s and 1990s, they decided, wait a minute, we've got all these kids. So what happened in the 1980s and 1990s? You guys were alive in the 1990s, weren't you? No? No, you weren't. You're all too young. What are we talking about? So what happened in the 1980s and 1990s, they had a lot of gang violence. And because there was a lot of gang violence, they would get some 17-year-old to off somebody, and then, of course, they'd go to juvenile court. Uh, they'd go to jail until they are 21 years old, and they had to release them. So this was going on over and over and over and over again with all this gang violence that was going on in the United States. So they decided in the 1980s and 1990s to change the rules. Before that, it was relatively rare for, for a 15 or 16 year old to kill somebody. All of a sudden, in the 1980s and 1990s, it became normal. Well, not normal, but it, it became more common. Those evaluating uh, juveniles for the possible transfer must uh, focus on the risk of future offending, the interventions uh, needed to reduce this risk, and the likelihood that the youth will respond favorably to such interventions. So before, of course, if you were 17 years old, they put you in juvenile, uh, juvenile uh, uh, jail. Uh, what do they call it? Juvie. Uh, juvenile, what was it? Reformatories. They had reformatories all over the United States. And why were they reformatories instead of prisons? Because they were supposed to reform the children, these children that had, uh, had committed a crime. <clears throat> but then all of a sudden, we had just masses of, uh, of kids uh, committing crimes. So they decided to change the rules. So now they had to decide whether to transfer, their, transfer them to adult court or not. Evaluating a youth being considered for transfer is a forensic evaluation. States vary in their spe specification of the age at which an adolescent is eligible for prosecution in, in, the, in the criminal system. Most still use the age of 14 or 15. So if you're 14 or 15 years old and you commit a capital crime, in some states you can be tried. Now if you remember, I told you the story of my cousin. He's my second cousin, so he's not that close to me, but he was my second cousin and he murdered somebody. They were, they were, I know, they were hitchhiking across, there were two of them, and they were hitchhiking across the country. This guy picked them up, they decided they wanted his car. Uh, so they knocked him out and they ran over him with the car and killed him. Then they threw it, they put, picked up his body and they threw it in the back of the car. Well, one of the kids was 16 and the other was 17. My cousin was 16 when it happened. And then they went and they tried to dispose of the car and they did it very poorly. And of course the car was found, they found the body in the back of the car, they realized what had happened. Their fingerprints, of course, were all over the place. And both of them had a, had a juvenile uh, record, uh, so they were both arrested. Well, they were, theoretically, they were arrested. But my cousin is really, really smart. So he decided that he would run away. And he ran away to Ohio. This was in Indiana. They, uh, they, they killed the guy in Illinois, 
they disposed of the, of the car and the body in Indiana, so it became a case in Indiana. It was Indiana that was, uh, uh, had the case. So in Indiana, if you are a juvenile, they've had this problem in Indiana before. If you're a juvenile, then they can try you as an adult. So since that was the case, he decided he'd go someplace that didn't extradite juveniles back to Indiana. So he went to Ohio. Ohio doesn't extradite juveniles uh, to Indiana because Indiana will try them as an adult. And the smart, he was so smart that he stayed away. And I already told you the story. The reason he came back was because of his girlfriend, who wasn't really his girlfriend anymore. And then they caught him. Actually, she turned him in to get him away, <laughs> to get rid of him. She turned him in, and lo and behold, he was 18 by this time. And so they could try him as an adult anyway. So they had already arrested the other guy, who was actually a year older than he was. They had already tried him. And he was on the docket. Uh, they hadn't finished his trial yet. So when the, they arrested the second kid, my cousin, uh, the first guy dropped a dime on him, and he spent uh, five years in jail. And my, my cousin, theoretically, was supposed to spend life in, in prison. But they let, let him out after about 17 or 18 years. Anyway, that's a great family reunion. That's, that's the guy I want to shake hands with. The guy that murdered somebody. And not only that, he killed somebody in prison, so he's got two teardrops coming off of his face. As cute as that is, I, teardrops are always so attractive. Tattoos. Uh, but it keeps people from wanting to uh, talk to him. Uh, there are several justifications for transfer into the criminal justice system. Uh, if somebody's charged with homicide, of course, uh, murdering somebody is, is one of the, the reasons uh, for, uh, for doing this. Um, there was a case of uh, two six-year-olds up in Chicago. Uh, they were trying to get a three-year-old to steal candy for them. The three-year-old wouldn't do it, so they decided that they would hold him outside the window uh, from an upper, upper story window. Uh, to get him to change his mind. Well, he wouldn't change his mind, he wouldn't change his mind, and he's wiggling all over the place, and they dropped it. Well, it was five stories. So he died. So what do you do with two six-year-olds that just murdered a three-year-old? Do you try him as an adult? What do you do with those two kids? What did they do with those two kids? Uh, that's exactly what happened to them. They, they put them in the foster, the foster care system, which I don't know if that helped them or not, but they couldn't try them. They were only six years old. They couldn't try them as adults. I mean, you don't try them. You don't put a six-year-old in prison for murder. I'm thinking. Anyway, they, yeah, they, they put them in the, the, uh, uh, the foster care system. That's all they could do with it. They, if you're six years old, do you understand death? Do you understand murder? Do you understand that if you do this, you pull the trigger or that somebody will die? I mean, they see cartoons all the time where the, where, where the uh, Wiley Coyote, geez, he falls off of a cliff in the Grand Canyon, goes all the way to the bottom, all of a sudden you see a puff of dust where he hits. And what happens next? Well, about two seconds later, there's Wiley Coyote trying to put together some kind of a rocket to to shoot the, uh, the road runner, as strange as that is. Does anybody ever die in a cartoon? Wait a minute, there's that one cartoon where the kid always dies. <laughs> South Park? South, South Park? Does he, somebody, Kenny always dies. Yeah, yeah okay. Kenny, Kenny always dies, okay. <laughs> but that's an adult cartoon, it's not a kid's cartoon. I mean, have you ever seen a Disney movie where somebody died? Even Dumbo's mother, didn't Dumbo's mother die? It was Bambi's mother that died. But you didn't see her being shot, you just heard the, the, the uh, gun go off, and then you saw Bambi's eyes fill up with tears. Isn't that the way it worked? I haven't seen, I haven't seen the movie for 50 years, so I can't remember 
for 60 years or so. <clears throat> anyway, Bambi's mother died. Didn't uh, Dumbo's mother die too? You wanted to ask a question about Dumbo? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of juvenile, um, there was a recent, <laughs> a recent report about, it was on news yesterday, I think, that a 10 year old um, killed a, I forgot what was it, I think it's like. But his grandma, was it? Oh, that's right, the, he had killed his <coughs> grandmother. That's right. No, this is a different one. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I heard about that one too. Yeah, I think yeah, it was 11 though. A child, a child in here has an adult. The ten, the ten year old girl. They're gonna try him as an adult. Yeah. And he's ten. She's ten. They're gonna try him as an adult. I wonder what's gonna happen. A ten year old. Is it here in Arizona? No. Somewhere. Oh. Somewhere else. Okay. I didn't see where the eleven year old was from. The one that killed his grandmother. Was oh, she wanted him to clean his his room. She told him to clean. It. So he killed her. That, that's not funny. Why am I laughing? That's not funny at all. Yeah, 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 killed him, yeah. Then he killed himself. Yeah, yeah, he killed him. Then he killed himself. Yeah, so he's not going to be correct for anything. Killed his grandmother, then he shot himself. Wow. <clears throat> Which, I guess. Uh, we have to ask the question, why does he have a weapon that he can kill his grandmother with? If he's 11, he was 11. How did the 10-year-old kill? What? Um, he stomped on the infant's head. He stomped on her? infant's head. He stomped on an infant's head. Because it was a stomp. Oh, my goodness. So he killed a baby. Oh my goodness. Okay. And they're going to try him as an adult. Well, 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 well let's be the jury. What do you think should happen? <clears throat> so you get all the evidence. You got a 10-year-old. He's being tried as an adult. You can execute him if you want. Jury. So what do you think, what do you think should happen? I'll start with Sharon. She's okay. always got good <laughs> ideas. <laughs> So what do you think should happen, Sharon? Execution? Execution? Okay. I was just wondering. He's 10 years old. It's a girl. It's a girl. She? It's a she? Yeah. It was a girl to give? Oh, it's a 10-year-old girl. I'm sorry. Her. Um, well, that's different. Yeah. What if the girls are different? <laughs> One's got long hair and the other's got short. Skip you. Skip you? Yeah. <laughs> We're coming back. All right. Okay. Ten-year-old girl stomps on a baby's head and kills it. I don't think she's being tried. And she's being tried as an adult. So we can we can do anything to her we want. So what do you want to do? Life in prison. Okay. Could be a really 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 long time. She might live into her nineties. That's eighty years of incarceration. We're coming back. Okay. <coughs> I say have custody. Have the state have custody of it to reform. Uh, I know there's a life that's lost, but you can probably repair her. So you want to repair her? I'll help her. Okay. Uh, not as an adult. You don't want to double what she did. Me tried as an adult. You don't have a choice. You're on the jury. Second degree with 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer speaks. Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what do you think? She's only 10. Sure, she's 10. Yeah. Well, not usually. You don't usually diagnose to her. You don't need it first. She's the first crazy yeah. ten year old. Okay. The ten year old got crazy. Yeah. Yeah, well, you came off with it, so <laughs> yeah, they stated they that she had um, obvious people out there. She has no help. 
Hey, what's going on here? Someone's watching the press release. Oh, okay. We have new information from the press release. No? So she has mental health problems. Yeah. Do we know what they are? Depression. So she's already being tried as an She's already being tried as an adult. Stomps on a baby. Stomps a baby to death. Okay. She's being tried as an adult. You're on the jury. What do you think of that? I was telling Ashley earlier when I came in, she was explaining to me that was that I probably would get the family structure first and then see what the relationship to the child that was. And then after that, maybe go from there whether... I'm just You're on the jury. You get to decide. Yes or no? Okay. Wait a minute. My yes, as an adult, or no. She is being tried as an adult. You don't have a choice. They are already trying her as an adult. So the question is, as a juror, what what are you going to do with her, with the ten year old? We're gonna have to probably get an evaluation. I would ask for an evaluation first, a mental evaluation of the child. Okay. Because attorney, the child that's where you go. Okay. We all are already have a prosecuting attorney. <laughs> <laughs> to give her 15, um, 15. 15, yeah, 15 years of food. <laughs> we're, we're coming back. Uh, we're going to 10 year old. Stomps a baby to death. The state decides to try her as an adult. What do you want to do? You're on the jury. What do you want to do? Yeah, You don't have a choice. The state's already done that. How do we agree or disagree? It doesn't matter. You're on the jury. They're trying. You're trying her as an adult. What are you going to do? Jury member. Vote. Well, what do you want to do with her? Execute her? Do you want to? No. Give her life in prison. Why is it second degree with 15 years? Probably 15 years. Mm. She's only 10 years old. So I know. <laughs> so? She's being tried as an adult and can't send her to juvenile court. You'd have to transfer her back to juvenile court. I guess if the whole jury agreed that she should be tried as a as a juvenile, then maybe you could send her back. But it's up, not up to you. Mm -hmm. It's up to the judge. It's the, only the judge can send her back to juvenile court. We'll talk about that in a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. no execution. No execution. Psychologist would say, not a juror. Oh, so okay, because I'm pretty sure there's things that 
20 years, okay. Who, who else did you decide? Who else did you make a decision? Tyrone, what are you doing? Mental health evaluation? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that's actually not up to the jury. That's actually up to the defense attorney or the prosecuting attorney or the judge to do that. Okay. Wow, this is a tough one, isn't it? Well, at least we got a lawyer <laughs> make a decision. <laughs> or maybe you're the judge and you're going to give her well, 50. where were the parents at? I don't know. I don't know the story. Steve came up with it. Oh. And then there was the 11-year-old that shot his grandmother because she told him to clean his room. Should, and then he shot himself. Should the parents be tried as well because they weren't watching the children? Do we do that? No. No, we can't. Do we blame the parents for what the children do? Can we send them to court because they weren't taking care of their not kids? Not unless it was their child that was in mm -hmm. with an immediate danger. Right. Right. I think it was she was in the daycare center. Right? I'm sorry? She was in the daycare center. Mm -hmm. Pay some kind of a fine. Sure. And we see these cases from time to time, don't we? Yeah. Neglect, where somebody something happens. There was a case in Montana. Just before I left uh, Montana, there was a case <coughs> where um, one family uh, was allowing somebody else to take care of their child. It was a daycare situation, but they were just babysitting. And she was giving the baby a bath, and uh, the telephone rang or something, and she was gone for 30 seconds, and of course the baby had slipped down into the water and drowned. Oh, oh, it was horrible. And they tried, they tried the woman who neglected. You know, who neglected the child, and they acquitted her. She was acquitted. But this was in the town where I was living. I actually was living outside the town. But this was in the town where we, where my wife went to church, and we bought our groceries. So we, everybody knew everybody else. I mean, and it was like somebody's second cousin or something. It was a real mess. So the family, the family was all pissed off. And that kind of splinter. And Sharon thinks it's funny. Okay. <laughs> it is. It's kind of humorous. Juveniles can be transferred to criminal court in different uh, ways. The state legislature can determine that certain offenses must be filed directly in adult court. That's statutory exclusion. That's what has happened in the state of Indiana. If a juvenile murders somebody, then they will be uh, remanded to the, uh, to the uh, adult court. That's automatic in Indiana. And that's one of the reasons, of course, in Indiana is uh, the... Um, ACLU um, uh, doesn't like the laws of the state of Indiana and they have come out against uh, the state. They're trying to get them to change their laws. Uh, of course, that hasn't happened yet. The juvenile court can decide whether the youth uh, should be transferred to criminal court. Uh, this is known as ju uh, judicial discretion. Prosecutors can decide whether cases are to be filed in initially in juvenile or adult court and this is prosecutorial discretion. So the question is, is putting juveniles in the adult system effective in reducing reoffending? That's the <coughs> idea. Uh, these individuals are so bad that they need to go to, to adult court. So the question is, do they reoffend? Uh, there's been no decline in juvenile crime after these transfer laws came into effect. The idea was that it's going to keep kids from from uh, uh, from uh, performing these uh, uh, adult crimes, uh, these, cr these capital crimes. That was the idea. If they think that they're going to be tried in adult court, then they won't commit the crimes. I mean, that's logical, isn't it? Uh, but the truth is that it doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Housing juveniles with adult criminals may promote criminal attitudes and motivations. This is something that we could have anticipated. <clears throat> So they're learning how to be better criminals, which is always good to go to school and to learn things. 
Higher rates of recidivism have been observed when youth are transferred. Juveniles in adult facilities were more likely to be sexually and physically assaulted than youth in juvenile facil excuse me, facilities. The men are bigger, so they're more likely to sexually and physically assault somebody. Some tiny little guy like this one. Juvenile transfer may also occur in the other direction. Juveniles placed in adult court are returned to juvenile court. And this is something that you guys were trying to decide. You were, you were thinking that maybe you could do this. Uh, but as jurors, I don't think that you have that, uh, that, that capability. It's only the judge that can do that. This procedure is called reverse transfer. 25 states currently have reverse transfer procedures that allow juveniles in, in adult court to petition for transfer back to juvenile court. And of course, that is the end of the chapter. And that is, wow. we tried the case. And what did we figure out? Fifth, we're going to charge her with second degree murder and give her 15 years. OK, there you go. I know this is a tough one, and this hurts. This bothers us when we have to make this kind of decision. But then again, we all voted yesterday. And we had to make some kind of a decision yesterday. Or we didn't. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, have they decided the Senate race yet? Does anybody has? Is that what you were watching? Whether they've decided whether McSally won or? I think it is McSally that won. Okay. Well, I looked at it earlier this morning at nine o'clock. They hadn't. They hadn't posted, they hadn't posted it yet. Yeah. But she was ahead by about one percentage. Mm -hmm. But uh, they hadn't counted all the votes yet. It may take a while. We'll see what happens. We'll see how this thing ends up. It looks like Georgia's going to go to the courts. Uh, yeah. Georgia's an interesting case because the guy that was uh, in charge of voting was running for governor. Oh, I know. And he did some fairly questionable things uh, while he was running. So we'll, we'll see what happens with this case. It'll probably go to the Supreme Court, I'm guessing. It, it, it can't just stay in, 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 in Georgia. It's, they're going to have to do something with it. Should be interesting. Mental health experts can be involved in hearings and trials in many civil areas, including the following psychological damages to civil plaintiffs, workers' compensation claims, the assessment of civil competence, psychological autopsies, and we'll talk about that in just a second, uh, child custody and parental fitness, which of course is a case that, uh, that my family just went through a couple years ago, a couple summers ago, civil commitment and re risk assessment. These are all things that uh, psychologists get involved in. An expert can testify if the testimony is relevant. Uh, the usefulness of the testimony outweighs whatever pre prejudicial impact it might have. And if the, judges, uh, if the judge believes that the testimony is based on sufficiently relevant and rel reliable scientific evidence. And uh, one of the, the ways you can do this is Darbert Kumbo, Kumbo uh, criteria. Uh, the question is, is this good science or is this bad science, is the question. Is it questionable science? Is psychology a science, is the other question. So the courts have to decide whether psychology is, a, is an actual science or not. It's certainly not physics. In physics, if, you, if, if I drop a, a quarter on the ground, it always goes down. It's always going to happen, unless I'm in outer space. As long as I'm on Earth and I drop my quarter, it's always going to fall straight down. That's, that's a, a, an exact science. But psychology, obviously, is not an exact science. You can't find any two psychologists that will agree with each other. Sometimes Sarah and I get into rip-snorting rip arguments about, about psychology. And it always comes down to, well, I went to Northwestern. <laughs> Well, I've been doing this for 25 years, <laughs> which is not an answer to anything. But we don't agree on things. Psychologists don't agree, don't always agree. Um, we can, and we can talk about the different uh, the theorists. Uh, some theorists uh, people accept, some people, they, some they don't. If we talk about Freud, a lot of people don't like Freud. A lot of people argue uh, 
against Freud. Some, some colleges, some graduate programs don't even teach Freud. When I was up in Montana, I was teaching with the University of Montana at Fort Belknap, and I taught Freud because, well, I've, I always teach Freud. Freud's the first guy. But they didn't teach Freud at all. They didn't even mention the guy's name. If they acted like he didn't exist, well, how can you do that? Well, that's the question I ask. How can you do that? And their answer was, well, we can't prove that any of his theories are correct. That's what they said. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. It's, he's still the first one. He's the one everybody argues with. We won't get into that. Anyway, so there, you can't find any two psychologists that agree with one another. Well, you can, but it's, it's a rarity. Judges often have uh, trouble evaluating scientific evidence, thus the concern that jurors will be exposed to junk science. And of course, sometimes psychology does sound like junk science. It does. And some psychologists are junk psychologists. <sighs> they say, if this happens, then this is going to happen. Well, you never know if that's going to happen. Actually, it may happen in 65% in of the cases, but in 35% of the cases, this isn't true. So does that make it junk science or not? Is this going to happen every time? And the answer is, of course, no. Uh, we're, we're talking about human brains and, uh, and, and environments. And environments will change the results of what happens. Smith, in 1989, cites the following potential objections to testimony by psychological or psychiatric experts. Now, remember, we're talking about experts here. Uh, the scientific foundation for much of the testimony offered in court is often less than adequate. And of course the problem is that we're talking about psychology. So you and I understand this stuff, but what if you're a juror? Or what if you're a prosecutor? Prosecutors are not psychologists. They don't understand this stuff. Defense attorneys aren't, aren't psychologists. So they don't understand this stuff. So what kind of, of verbiage are we going to use? What kind of language are we going to use when we testify? So a lot of times it's inadequate. And a lot of times they come up with the wrong conclusions. They're not psychologists. This is science. We may agree on, on, on the outcome, but these guys are lawyers and they have no clue. They're clueless. So is the judge. What about that judge in, uh, that heard the Manafort case? The guy was 74 years old. He doesn't even use email. So how is he going to understand what we're talking about? He doesn't even use email. Let alone he's never seen Facebook, so he has no clue what's going on in the world. Well, he has a clue what's going on in his world, but it may not be in our world. So the problem is that sometimes the information that we give them is not enough. We need to give them better information. How uh, much of the testimony is, is limited, it is of limited relevance. Uh, we are psychologists, so all we can talk about is psychology. We can't make a prediction as to whether this guy is guilty or not. We can't make that prediction. It's, and we shouldn't make that prediction. And if we do make that prediction, then we're overstepping our bounds. Okay. So sometimes we give them a lot of information because this little piece of information is actually relevant. But we have to, in order to get there, we have to tell the whole story. Exactly. So this little piece of information is going to be relevant. So we're either giving them a lot of irrelevant information or we're not actually giving them all the relevant information that we have. Experts are too often permitted to testify about ultimate issues which should be left to juries to decide. In other words, are they guilty or are they not guilty? Is it possible that this person is the one that, that committed the crime? We can't make that determination. All we can say is, according to what we see, it's probable that he did it. Are there any absolutes in psychology? Any at all? Not one. So this is, this is never... If this happened, then this happened. It never, this never fits into psychology. There are no absolutes. None. So we can't make any determination. But sometimes, if the prosecuting attorney hires me as the, as the expert witness, I'm going to say, that, oh, he definitely killed him. But, 
He hired me, of course. Yeah. So I'm going to give him the information that he wants. Otherwise, he won't hire me the next time. Mm -hmm. And I like being hired because he pays me $20,000 to testify, or whatever it is. I don't know how much it is. But I like money. It's kind of like idiocracy. <laughs> I like money. I can't believe you like money, too. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that movie. I watched that movie probably like three times a week. Oh my goodness gracious. It's funny. It's nice background noise. It would make my brain stupid <laughs> just watching that movie. It makes me read. <laughs> so the guy turns out to be a genius and he's actually he's not that bright. He didn't even score on the IQ scale, yet it was because he read, he knew how to read, that's what made him not I like the guy that tries to pick the lady up, but she's a prostitute, so he tries to pick her up. <laughs> and she says, come back tomorrow, and he gives her <laughs> more And he's more paying money. her. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, goodness. Expert testimony is frequently used to introduce uh, information that would otherwise be prohibited because it is hearsay. And of course, this is a problem as well. Um, but as an expert uh, witness, of course, we can present this information. The adversarial system compromises experts' objectivity. Uh, one of the things that happens is that if you're an expert uh, witness for the defense, the uh, prosecuting attorney can question you. And of course, the prosecuting attorney is not a psychologist either. So he's going to uh, question you as if you were a, a, uh, as if you were a lawyer, just like him. Uh, and the reality is, of course, he's going to argue with you. Is it possible that this didn't happen? Well, as a psychologist, I will always say, yes, it's possible that this didn't happen, even though I just testified that it probably did happen. But then he will, he will get me to refute myself. Mm -hmm. And it's the adversarial system. What should, in, in essence, what should happen is I should just present the information, and they shouldn't be able to question me at all. It shouldn't be adversarial at all. But I shouldn't be hired by one side to give my information. I should be hired by the court to give my information. And of course, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Expert testimony is very expensive, and relying on experts gives an advantage to the side with more money. And we've talked about this before. It seems like justice is only there for the wealthy people. And that's because they can pay for it. So they'll pay for the best judge, they'll pay, or not for the best judge, they'll pay for the best uh, attorney. <laughs> Hopefully they will. they're not paying I don't know everybody. About that. I don't know that might have changed. <laughs> but the reality is I can throw all the, if I've got lots of money, I can throw all, all this money into my defense and probably I will be able to get off because I've got all these expert witnesses that are brilliant and of course I just paid them a lot of money so they're going to say exactly what I want them to say. So rich people get off scot-free, as it turns out, because they have money. Testing the reliability and validity of uh, expert opinions uh, through cross-examination is inadequate because attorneys are usually not well equipped to do this, and juries often fail to understand what, it is, what is uncovered during the cross-examination. And of course, this is a problem. Juries are not psychologists either, usually. Uh, if you are a psychologist and there is a psychological aspect uh, to this case uh, and you're in the jury pool, they're not going to put you on the jury. They won't put you on the jury. I have a PhD. The probability of me being, a, uh, being on a jury is, is zero percent. There's just no way in hell I'm ever going to be put on a jury. So that's how you avoid jury duty. That's <laughs> 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 Life hack. <laughs> uh, they usually don't want people with too much knowledge. Um, remember, I told you the case, uh, my, my brother was, in a, uh, was on a jury one time. My brother has an associate degree in, uh, he's a surveyor. So he's an associate degree in surveying. Uh, but when, when he was uh, on the jury, he actually tried the case himself because He's that kind of a guy. I mean, he reads all the time, so he's all this extra information. Well, they didn't ask him, well, what do you read? You know, they didn't ask him that question. So they put him on the jury, and it turned out that he had more knowledge than the judge 
and, and, and either <laughs> the prosecuting attorney or the defense attorney. So he actually tried the case in, in the uh, uh, jury room, which pissed the judge off, pissed, certainly pissed the prosecuting attorney off. You had the surveyor come in. You had to have the surveyor come in <laughs> and tell everyone what the hell's going on. Anyway, so my brother will never be on another jury either. <laughs> Uh, experts disagreeing with, uh, and, and his sister was a lawyer, so that has something to do with it as well. He used to argue with her all the time, which was kind of funny, listening to them argue, because they both sound like lawyers, and of course he's a surveyor, and she's a lawyer. And, and he would win. He would beat my sister. Experts agree, disagreeing with one another in trial after trial ultimately reduces the public's esteem for the mental health professionals, and this is a problem. Uh, we lose our credibility. Uh, Grisso's uh, 2003 criticisms of forensic mental health assessment. Uh, one is ignorance, not knowing or not using the proper legal standards. Uh, so the problem is that if you are an expert witness uh, in a select state, you need to know what the laws are. And of course, most psychologists are not lawyers, and they don't have a clue. Uh, so ignorance is one of the problems. Irrelevance, providing evidence that goes beyond what is relevant to the proceedings. Uh, this individual, of course, is up there to be an expert witness, so they're giving all this information. Sometimes part of that information just like I tell stories that don't, are, don't seem relevant, uh, a lot of psychologists will put in uh, extra information that isn't relevant to the case and doesn't need to be there. And this is very common. Uh, you, maybe you've been to, not my class of course, but I'm sure you've been to classes where the, the uh, instructor uh, gives you information that doesn't have anything to do with anything that you're really supposed to be talking about. No, that happens. It happens with my, my poor son. <laughs> He'll go into a class, he's taking mathematics, and this is theoretical mathematics, and the guy will just throw just tons of stuff at him. And then they're, and they're taking notes and writing all this stuff down. Well, he's not gonna test them over this stuff. Well, that's the problem. He's giving them, he, you know, he just read a paper, so he's, he's telling them about the paper that he just read. You know, and none of this stuff is relevant to what they're studying, and, and it's not going to, it's certainly not in the textbook, and it's certainly not going to be on the test. It's irrelevant information that they're getting. And I'm sure that you don't have anybody here that actually gives you irrelevant information. <laughs> Maybe me every once in a while. <laughs> usually my stories have a point. Sometimes I forget what that point is, but usually my stories have a point. Intrusion, offering conclusions that impinge upon the court's domain. And the reality is you're not supposed to do that. If you're an expert witness, you are not supposed to make a conclusion. That is the job of the judge and the jury, make it, to make a conclusion. So if you give a conclusion, this guy definitely did it uh, because he's, you know, uh, he's uh, a psychopath or whatever. Um, you know, that, that is, uh, uh, you're impinging on their, uh, on their domain. Insufficiency, providing limited supporting evidence for one's conclusions. And of course, we can go the other way. Sometimes we give irrelevant information. Sometimes we really don't support what we're talking about. We make a conclusion, and instead of telling the story all the way through and saying how we got to that conclusion, sometimes we leave steps out. So we haven't given them as much information as we should have. Uh, incred incredibility. Uh, offering conclusions that are not justified by the evidence one provides. And that's another problem that Grisso found in expert witnesses. To reduce the overly adversarial nature of uh, expert testimony, some have proposed to limit the number of experts on a given topic, which makes sense. That's very logical. Mm -hmm. Require that the experts be chosen from an approval uh, panel rather than the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney, here I'll give you $20,000 to testify that this happened. Instead of doing that, we have a uh, select uh, a group, uh, not, not the prosecuting attorney or the, the defense attorney, but a, a, a panel that chooses who will be the expert witness. Allow testimony only from experts who have been appointed by a judge. In other, in other words, they are uh, friends of the court, what we refer to as friends of the court. 
which means that they are not, uh, they, they are, the judge has appointed them. They are not for the prosecution, they're not for the defense, they are friends of the court and the judge has selected them. Several reforms of expert testimony have been proposed. Courts should not allow clinical opinion testimony unless it can be shown that it satisfies standards of scientific reliability. And of course, there is always a question as to how scientific uh, psychology is. Uh, some people call it a soft science. Mm -hmm. I used to teach at an institution where the individual in charge of my department was a physicist. No, he wasn't. He was a biochemist. Uh, and he used to tell me all the time that uh, I don't know what you're doing in my department, the science department, because yours is not a science. It's a soft science. And then eventually he told me, he, he uh, admitted to me that uh, he had, had had to go through counseling. And the counseling, that's, yeah, I know. <laughs> so is this a soft science or is it not a soft science? Yeah. We used to argue all the time. Well, he used to argue with me all the time. Like, usually I just kept my mouth shut. Sometimes you can win by not saying it. We can, you can allow him to show how stupid he is by, by saying all these things. Anyway, uh, so he used to call it a soft science. So the question is, is it a reliable science? And of course, if we have the, uh, the research behind us uh, to prove that this is, this is potentially true, uh, then of course it is uh, scientifically reliable. Ban any reference to witnesses as experts. Instead, use opinion, testimony, or witnesses. In other words, not, don't call us experts anymore. Say this is our psychological opinion. That would change things uh, a great deal. Otherwise, it's one expert versus another expert. So which one is correct, the defense, defense expert or the uh, prosecuting uh, expert? And as it turns out, of course, it's the guy that costs the most money that is the best ex expert, obviously. Read a special instruction to juries before any opinion testimony in order to reduce its possible prejudicial impact. And of course, that isn't done either. When one party is injured by the actions of a second party, the injured individual can sue the, the uh, second party to recover monetary damages as co compensation for uh, the injury. So if you're, uh, if you're walking out of the uh, classroom and you slip and fall down on the steps down here, potentially you can sue the, uh, the college. You can sue Diné College. There you go. Uh, so you are the party of the first part. Uh, the college is, is the party of the second part. Uh, you have been damaged. You have been injured in one way or another uh, because you fell down on the... Now, all of you are going to fall down <laughs> and try to get cash out of the college. You're trying to get compensation for your injury. <laughs> Must it right there? Yeah. <laughs> there no, right here, right here. Oh, that thing's going to fall. You know, it's, I don't think there's any water in that thing. Must it right there now? <laughs> yeah, Chris is, always sits here. He's after the, he's after the money. After the money. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. I hope he gets some money out of this. <laughs> this action is covered by an area of civil law known as torts. Torts sounds like something you, that you eat, but it's not. It is a form of law. A tort is a wrongful act that causes harm to an individual. That is a tort. Uh, so, and they have, they have classes in, in court law, how you get money for injury, for co how, how you get compensation. Four <laughs> elements are involved in proving a tort in a court of law. If it can be established that there was a duty, <laughs> Diné College had a duty that was breached. In other words, they had an unsafe situation. Uh, which proximally caused the harm resulting, uh, resulting, and of course this is you falling down and hurting yourself. So they had a duty to have a fixed stair down there, and they breached that duty and it caused you harm. Then potentially you have a, 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 a tort case that maybe you can get some money out of. Sounds like name calling tort. Tort, yeah. You, you, you tort. <laughs> I think you're thinking of tart. 
<laughs> which actually is something that you eat, but it's also a, a woman of the night or something. A tart. <laughs> <laughs> Like women don't exist in the night. <laughs> women of the night. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Historically, the law sought to compensate victims who were physically hurt or sustained property losses, but was reluctant to allow compensation for emotional distress, such as pain and suffering. Uh, for example, uh, pain and suffering. And of course, now uh, people charge you with pain and suffering all the time. Uh, so potentially you could charge me with pain and suffering because I'm making you write a paper, it was due this week, and if you didn't get it done, theoretically, of course I don't do this, uh, but uh, some uh, professors would say that they won't accept it if it's, if it's late, that, you know, that kind of thing. In, in which case, you could probably charge me with pain and suffering <laughs> because I'm forcing you to do something you don't want to do. <laughs> But then again, I could sue you because it's painful to read some of your papers. <laughs> and sometimes I spend all day reading your papers, so I'm suffering through trying to correct all that. Oh, I thought you were going to say read it. Just reading it was the pain and suffering. Well, of course that is the pain and suffering. I'm spending all day trying to correct your stuff. Mostly just grammatical mistakes. I feel like that's the painful part. That is the painful part. <laughs> This has changed in recent years, of course. Uh, now two types of psychological injuries are claimed in civil uh, lawsuits. Uh, those arising from negligent behavior. Uh, those arising from extreme and outrageous conduct that is intended to cause distress. In other words, if I, if I, if I tried to uh, sue the college or if I had problems with HR and HR was giving me a hard time and every time I went down there, uh, you know, Merle, I don't know if you guys know Merle or not, but it, yeah, every time I went down there, Merle went and hid in his office and pretended he wasn't there, then it would cause me, uh, his extreme and outrageous behavior would cause me distress because I can't get in to see Merle. Now I'm going to sue him for uh, negligent behavior because he's not taking care of me or something like that. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, they're having problems with the water in, the, in uh, Hogan housing. Uh, some of the water pipes are breaking, some of the toilets are breaking. My toilet's been broken since the day I got here. It's, it, it runs, but I fixed it with a, with a ballpoint pen. I fixed it with a ballpoint pen, and it's been working for three years now because I'd stuck that ballpoint pin in there and kept it from running. I know, this is great stuff, isn't it? <laughs> but potentially, potentially I could, what's happening is these guys are having to pay, I mean, poor Ed, his water line broke and it broke underneath his house. Oh, and he, they lost all of this water. Well, uh, Arizona can't lose any water, my goodness, it's barely got any at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he lost just, you know, gallons and gallons of water, and they made him pay for it. What? But the water line broke underneath his house. There was nothing he could do. He wasn't there at the time, but he, I, the only, the only uh, evidence was that there was a puddle out in the back of his property. Yeah. Marius, are you ready for this? Marius's toilet, while he was gone over the summer, developed a hole in the, uh, the float, the, the, that yeah. little plastic ball. It developed a hole, filled up with water, and then it started running. So he ran, ran, ran all day, ran all night. And he was gone. Yeah. $500 worth of water. Why didn't you guys sue for that? Or at least negotiated something? Well, he did. He negotiated. He only had to pay $100, extra $100. I don't think it would have been that well, I don't think that's right either. No. For either because of Because when I first moved into my apartment that first winter I had, the pipes broke. And we had just gotten home and the kids ran to their room. There's a whole puddle they ran into. Anthony was like, Mom, there's a swimming pool in the hallway. And I'm like, what are you <laughs> talking about, man? You know, so I walked down there and sure enough, there was water coming down. It started it was flooded swimming. everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was like, just get the towels. And it was late at night, all the 
workers were gone, I tried calling the emergency number, I tried calling Albuquerque, finally called NTUA, and NTUA told me that it wasn't their, their business because it was on NHA property and it was under Sandstone property, which is a private <coughs> company away from the Navajo Nation, so they couldn't do it. And I was like, well, just somebody can do <laughs> you know, so I called one of the maintenance guys who lived there at that time, thankfully, and I went to his house, banged on his door, told him that you need to get down here or else you guys are not going to be happy with me. And so he finally came down, and when he got there, finally, NTUA showed up, turned off the water, did everything they could, and I was like, now you guys are going to stay outside and fix that hole because I need my toilet and I need my seat because oh, I okay. pay rent just like everybody else here, probably even more than some. I was like, so fix it. And I made them do it. And then they tried, NTUA told me that my bill was going to go up. So it did go up, and I took it to my manager, and I told her, you're paying for that, because you guys are supposed to be maintaining the property and maintaining the lines that are under it as well. See, we needed, Marius needed you <laughs> to, talk, to talk to those guys. Anyway. I go with the whole not, the net college concept. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so that's what I took away from being here at this college. So potentially I could sue because yeah. my toilet has been broken for three years. And nobody wants that. And nobody so you wants just to bring that up and they'll... And every time they inspect my, my house, I tell them my toilet's broken. Like, and I'll oh, say, oh, nice. we'll send somebody out next week. I know. I had to help unclog a, a drain, too, on the net college property during that whole mix of mess that I was having with them, the whole argument. And I had to go onto their property and help one of their people with the problem that their person's been trying to report for three months. And it was simple as a clogged drain. That much grease in it. That was never even cleared out when the previous tenant before. So I got that on video. <laughs> Take time and stand. Did it cause you distress? <laughs> yes. Okay. Took time was it extreme and outrageous? <laughs> Me going over there to go help someone was extremely outrageous. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> At least you knew how to fix it. Yeah. And I was like, just fix Here, it. just take a ballpoint. Just yeah. fix it. <laughs> Works every time. In recent years, an increasing number of cases have dealt with psychological uh, injuries resulting from the tort of sexual harassment, usually in the workplace. And of course, this is what the whole Kavanaugh uproar was about. This lady's been suffering from being sexually assault, uh, uh, assaulted, allegedly, by Brett Kavanaugh when she was 15 years old. Um, the psychological injuries have to do with, uh, with PTSD, uh, has to do with, uh, with uh, paranoia. Uh, she's afraid to be in a, a closed room uh, with only one exit. Uh, so she, when she built her house, she always put two doors in every room so that there would always be an escape route. Because when she was 15 years old, she got thrown into a bedroom and allegedly Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her. And because of that, for the rest of her life, she's in her 50s now. So is that, psychologi is that a psychological injury? Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Plaintiffs can seek both compens compensatory damages, payment for injuries suffered, and punitive damages punishing the company for its failure to respond properly to the misconduct. So theoretically, you can sue Diné College if you fall down on the steps. You can so, sue them for, for compensatory uh, damages and also punitive damages because they didn't fix it. Now they've had all kinds of problems with this building. Tons of different problems. Uh, if you walk out the front door, the uh, <laughs> it dips. It dips. So if you're not thinking, or you're not, you're you're thinking, you're, you're walking along, and it's going. To be, there's a dip right over here in this room. The cement. There's a dip down there. Yeah, exactly. So if you're not thinking about it, you might you know, grab yourself and fall down or something. But there's a, a big one. I mean, it's like this much down there. So they've tried to fill it up with those plastic, yeah, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> with rugs, with rugs. So they've tried to fill it up with rugs, but you can still feel it as you're walking out. So potentially that's punitive damages because they have not, uh, they have not tried to fix something that was broken. I think about that often with the gas station where the pumps are. 
Oh, there's all those was, yeah. really bad And dips. then it's like we put in so much money into that place that we deserve a better parking lot, I think. Because when you get there, there's like... All your cars are where you park. <laughs> all your cars are jacked up. I drive a car that has this much clearance, okay? So if I fall into that hole, I'm not coming back out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll never get yeah, out of that hole. My sister drives a Buick too, so I took in that there, and it was like kind of the same. Yeah. I had to rock myself out Boom. of there and put a look in. <laughs> <laughs> I never get gas. <laughs> I I can't. There's no place I can I can get gas. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll fall into the the, uh, the holes over there. You can see a big truck. Yes, that's what I'll do. You know, I don't really enjoy driving that little bitty car. It's no fun whatsoever. So I think what I'm going to get is a jacked up truck. A diesel truck. <laughs> that I have to pull myself into. So I'm riding with Marius, Marius the other day. I was riding with Marius. I don't know if you've ever seen his truck, but you have to... You literally have to climb into it. I mean, there's a rope that you have to climb in order oh to get up. Lord. I don't know how his wife gets into the truck. <laughs> and he loves it. He thinks it's the best truck in the whole wide world. You know he's got a new truck. He's got a brand new truck. They just bought a new truck. So what is he driving? He's driving that old beater. <laughs> it's jacked up. And he wants to put the same package on his new truck that he's got on his old truck. I know. I don't know how his kids get in, into that truck. They're only this tall. Well, that's how high the truck is. And you got it. Uh, I'm too old to be getting into trucks like that. A clinician assessing a plaintiff will typically conduct an evaluation that includes a social history, a clinical interview, psychological testing, third party interviews, a review of available records. So, this is what you have to do as a, uh, to evaluate your clients. The clinician forms an opinion about the person's psychological condition. The clinician determines whether the psychological problems were caused by, were aggravated by, or existed before the tort. And this is the argument. So you're going to go to court and you're testifying for the, the plaintiff, uh, and you're, you have to decide which of these is, is the case. So probably you're going to decide that it was aggravated, either their psychological problem was caused by the problem at the company, or it was aggravated by the company. But the company is going to hire a psychologist to come in, and they will decide that this was existing before the problem. So now we, got it, we get to have an argument between two experts, which you're not really going to argue at all. So one of you is going to be put on, on the stand, <clears throat> and you're going to say that, no, that it was uh, definitely, this guy was fine before, the, uh, before they, they screwed up and, and started uh, uh, harassing him. And, and so his problems, his psychological problems, are caused by, not only that, but it's aggravated by all of their, uh, their harassment of him. And the other guy is going to come up and say, no, this guy was nuts before, before. And, and it, it didn't cause any problem at all. He already had this problem. He's had this since he was a little kid. That's what he's going to say. So now we get, we get to argue in court. Plaintiffs may be motivated to exaggerate their claims in order to improve their chances of winning large awards. We used to see this in the military all the time. Oh, I'm sick today. Really? What a, what a, a, a surprise since we have to move, you know, 3,000 3, pounds of, 300 tons of stuff. And now you're you're sick today because because I don't know because you don't want to do it I guess this is known as malingering we talk about malingering all the time in medicine um, somebody that malingers is somebody that's lying they're not telling the truth they're not really as sick as they say they are they're exaggerating their problems in other cases a real psychological disturbance is present but the plain plaintiff will exaggerate its seriousness. So if it was a difference between a million dollars and a hundred thousand dollars, would you lie to get up to get to the extra nine hundred thousand dollars? If you exaggerate your problems, would you do it for nine hundred thousand? Would you lie? To exaggerate your problems? Would you do it? Nine hundred thousand dollars? Not enough. 
I want an extra million in my 1.9. Would, would you do it for 1.9? 1.9. Um, yes, yeah. Everybody has their phones. I, I, You're not going to lie? No, I, I, All you um, have to do is lie. I, uh, my sister, she had a same thing happened. She did a court man's comp, and then uh, she filed it. And they told her to come down to Phoenix, and she claimed that her whole, all, whole, all, her whole arm was burned and she could use it. All this time on, on the trip to Phoenix, they had a, the, they hired a detective or whatever. Yeah. Oh, follow her around. <laughs> they, they even paid for her rooms, her meals, everything, and we were like, Going along with her, and said, like, "You know what? You should probably take it easy. They're probably looking at you." <laughs> and sure enough, when, they, when she came to get her her compensation, they opened up the the video, and she was doing high dives, driving, <laughs> <laughs> playing pool, uh, eating, uh, and mm. she came back with nothing. nothing. Yeah. Did you do it? No, because... <laughs> How much is it going to cost us to get you... To lie? To lie. <laughs> You'd have to get my mom to make me the lie. Because my mom is my biggest influence, and the lingering is a word she used to use a lot when I was a kid. Like, stab me the lingering, get over here, help me do this, do this. So of course I do it for 1.9 million. <laughs> I'd only do it for if your mom tells you, okay, so we have to get your mom. Yeah, <laughs> Would you do it for 1.9 million? I don't think I could commit to it. Like, like kind of like, for yeah, money? like what Francis is saying, it's like you have to, I think it's going to be like a long period of time. Yeah. And you have to like stay committed to that, and I don't think I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not for any amount of money. <laughs> okay. Even if I could give you enough money that you wouldn't have to do there anything There would probably for be the rest of repercussions, like I would probably get in trouble. Give it yeah, <laughs> I would give myself away. Would you do it? <laughs> How much would it cost to get the uh, brats? Would you do it? Like Steph, but you would have to get my dad involved. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is tough. We're going to have to get the whole family. Yeah. Yeah. Would you do it? No, I think I get caught. <laughs> Honestly. What if it was worth, yes. uh, you wouldn't have to work for the rest of your life. You could buy yourself a mansion and live high on the hog for the rest of your life. No? You still wouldn't do it? No, I feel guilty. You know, like you would go wrong. Yeah. How much? I think I'd get caught because a lot of it just go into donation. If I could give you enough money that you'd never have to do anything for the rest of your life, would you do it? No? No. You guys are too honest. Would you do it? How much? I'm offering uh, $40,000. No, how about $100,000? I like the uh, $2 million. <laughs> $2 million, okay. okay. Or, you know, $7,000. Maybe $2 million. For the rest of my life. No, I can't pay you. I, I'm going to have to pay you. Because that only needs to allow It's going to have to be a lump sum. Because otherwise it's, you know. Two million? Okay, two million. Okay. Like no, actually, they, they, that could happen. I could pay you seven thousand for every. Yeah. But if we win our kids. Price, yeah. Okay. There's there's a there's a deal that we have to if make. If we win the kids. You wouldn't do it? Come on. For for a couple mil. A bill? A billion dollars. Like I've got a billion dollars. Would you do it? No. Oh, man. So here's the deal. So the settlement, the settlement's two million dollars. Guess how much I get as the as your lawyer? Half twenty percent of that. Yeah, I get thirty percent. Would you do it? Would I do it? No. <laughs> I don't need the He's money. Not the answer that for the people. I've got a wealthy wife. I don't need to. Teach wealthy people. wealthy <laughs> wife. Not that well. <laughs> I called up my. I tried to get some money out of the, the ATM the other day. We didn't have any money in the bank. We were broke. I had just gotten paid. Wait a minute. I've been through this before, right? 
but uh, she had she just bought a, a car. She paid four thousand dollars cash, not for the car, but the difference between the two cars. Anyway, <laughs> we were broke. Uh, when a worker is injured in the course of his or her job, the law provides for the worker to be compensated through a streamlined system that avoids the necessary necessity of proving a tort. This system, available in all 50 states and in the federal government, is known as workers' compensation law. Is workers' compensation, uh, does, does, does the reservation have workers' compensation? Are you guys part of that? The whole federal government has it. Every state. But you guys are autonomous. You're different. Are you, you don't have workers' compensation? They do, but the company will argue it to the nail. And a lot of times... The company is do, the tribe. Yeah, exactly. So that's why a lot of Navajos won't pursue it or try to pursue it. You're better off if you get hurt on the job, off the reservation, and getting that workers' comp than you are here on the reservation. Oh, goodness gracious. That. I don't know if that's, if that's good or not. What am I doing here? <laughs> well, you're different, so... My ass? They're going to have to, you. I mean, the law doesn't even apply to you here, so... Well, that's right. I can't be yeah. arrested here, can I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In workers' compensation systems, the employers contribute to a large fund that insures uh, workers who are injured at work, and employers also waive the right to blame the worker or some other individual for the injury. If you want to get an, uh, uh, if you want Sue to go off on a tangent, ask her about workers' compensation, because <laughs> she owns a company, and she has to pay into this workers' compensation thing. Even if nobody yeah. gets hurt, it still costs it's her insurance. money. Yeah. yeah, she has to pay into workers' compensation. So if you want to get her on on a tangent, ask her about workers' compensation. Just don't ask her about her house. Ah, uh, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has anybody seen her lately? I saw her yeah, last night. Yeah, I saw her last yeah. night. Yeah, she's on crutches now. Thing. She's got a broken foot and broken, broken kneecap. Knee. Wow. If workers are compensated, the size of the award they receive is determined by the type and duration of the injury and their salary at the time of the injury. So how much do you get? Does any, has anybody ever had, been on workers' compensation? You get 66% of your salary. So if I'm making $1,000 a month, I'll get $666 uh, a month, workers' compensation. Uh, of course, they pay into the uh, company pays into the workers' compensation every month, every month, and they complain about it. Of course, we've got a businessman for president right now, and he's changing all the laws. And a lot of the laws that he's changing have to do with this kind of stuff. So you need to be very careful as to what's going to happen mm -hmm. next. Uh, he's already changed the EPA, so this is something else. He thinks that business people don't make enough money. And he that's one of the reasons why he gave you guys the tax... He gave you guys. He gave them a tax... <laughs> but so this, this could very potentially... This potentially could go away in the future. So you need to be cognizant of the fact that this president wants to do away with all this automatic stuff that people have to do. He doesn't like paying into uh, Medicare. He doesn't like paying into Social Security. So the Republicans have been thinking of cutting Social Security and cutting Medicare because it costs them too much money as rich people. Yeah. You got to be careful. You got to watch this stuff. Why don't we stop right here? We'll pick it up next time. Now that I'm upset about workers' comp going on. <laughs>